Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is the death penalty. Joining us to discuss it is Ben Jones with Conservatives Concerned About the Death Penalty, a project of Equal Justice USA. Ben is also pursuing a PhD in political science at Yale University. Typically in this country, we think of conservatives as pro-death penalty, but your group seeks to convince conservatives specifically that they, they should oppose the death penalty. Why is that? Over the recent years and decades, there have Across the country, conservatives, liberals, everyone in between uh, have really been rethinking the death penalty. And there have been a, a number of problems in how it's been applied. Uh, most notably, you've had innocent people sent to death row, later found innocent. Some executions go forward despite uh, strong doubts over whether the person was guilty. And I think you know these factors have led people to really reconsider this issue, and especially among conservatives. So we've had some very high-profile conservatives come out against the death penalty, folks like Richard Vigory, Ron Paul, Brett Bozell, uh, and others. And I think there are several factors um, that is that are really driving conservatives to look at this issue again. Um, one is the death penalty is a government program, and like a lot of government programs, there are problems with it and mistakes are made. And the thing with the death penalty is that it's a punishment that's irrevocable. So if you make a mistake, there's no way to go back and fix it. And I think that has a lot of people concerned. Also, you look at the death penalty, it's incredibly costly. Um, study after study keeps coming out and showing that it costs millions of more than the alternative of life in prison without parole. And given the fact that it's, you know, there's not much evidence that it's keeping us safe for lowering crime rates, that's leading a lot of fiscal conservatives to question whether or not it's, it's really worth the price tag to keep the death penalty in place. And I think lastly and importantly, um, you know, a lot of people uh, come at this from a pro-life perspective. And you know, one thing about the death penalty is no one wants to see an innocent life put at risk. And if we have a system that makes mistakes and that time and time again has put innocent life at risk. Um, that leads a lot of people to question the program too. Do we uh, do we have an idea? Uh, I've, historically, the support on either both the left and the right, if I remember correctly, has been really high for the death penalty in America. Uh, has that been on a d distinct downward trend? And maybe on the left, are they still? They used to be over fifty percent, mostly for supporting the death penalty. Are they still above 50 percent? You have seen views on the death penalty change uh, pretty significantly in the past couple of decades. Um, we peaked in the 90s. Um, 80 percent were in supportive of the death penalty. That's taking everyone together. And since then, there have been, you know, people learned about DNA. All these wrongful convictions have come out. And you've seen support for the death penalty drop by about 20 percentage points um, in the past few decades, which is significant. Furthermore, I think what's really telling about polls on the death penalty is that when you ask people, um, you know, for the crime of murder, do you favor the death penalty or life in prison without parole? When people have that option, support for the death penalty drops even lower. You find it's around people are pretty evenly split in terms of whether they favor the death penalty or life in prison without parole. And what that shows is that when people know that there is an alternative that can keep dangerous folks locked up, keep society secure, they're much more willing to let go of the death penalty. With regards to the question of how it breaks down by uh, political leanings or political party, um, you know, it, it is true that you find that generally people on the left are more against the death penalty. Um, I think the most recent Gallup poll actually had had it at 50 or below 50 percent for folks on the left. But I think, you know, as more and more conservatives uh, take a new look at this issue, um, you're going to see support among conservatives drop too. And what was really interesting, there was a poll that came out recently, and it was looking at views among Christians on the death penalty. 
And what it found was that there was a very sharp generational gap in terms of younger Christians were much less likely to support the death penalty than their parents. And I think, you know, you're seeing that more and more there's a generational gap. And, you know, just from interacting with folks, um, working with young Republicans, young pro-life groups, um, you're seeing among young people a much um, a greater willingness to let go of the death penalty and be supportive of repealing it and replacing it with life in prison without parole. And some states too have, have also recently changed some of those policies, correct? Yeah. Uh, there have been s- six states in the past six years that have repealed the death penalty and replaced it with life in prison without parole. Um, through popular measures or, or mostly state legislators? Uh, mostly s- state legislators, l- legislatures. Um, so I believe five of those five of those states, it was through the legislature, and one of those uh, states, it was the courts. Uh, in New York, they the court struck down the death penalty as unconstitutional. There was an effort in the legislature to bring it back, but that failed. Your arguments so far against the death penalty have been kind of about how it can go wrong, in the sense that it's it can cost a lot of money, it can put innocent people away. Um, but I'm wondering if is – there, is there still opposition to it even if those sorts of problems either are off the table or are minimized? So if we could somehow you know, guarantee that we weren't going to kill innocents or – Do much better, yeah. Um, that would there – is there – is the death penalty contrary to, to justice as well or is it just that we can't, we can't do it well enough – you know, from a cost or from an accuracy standpoint to overcome these other secondary concerns? People come at this issue from a lot of different perspectives. And I, I think a lot of people are just, you know, they're, they're fed up with the system. And they also realize what's at risk. Um, you know, we've had the death penalty for centuries. And for centuries, we've had problems with it. And, you know, what's at stake is a potentially innocent life if you if you make a mistake. So, when people you know, see the track record, see everything that, that has gone wrong, and they see what, what hangs in the balance, um, people are saying, you know, we need to really step back and not go forward with this. Um, you do see, um, you know, there is, you know, other people do approach this from a moral perspective. And, you know, there's been an interesting debate about this, um, especially within the Catholic Church, which has done a lot of thinking on this issue. And you know, John Paul II, Pope John Paul II, was very vocal in his opposition for the death pen- his opposition to the death penalty. And you, you see that manifest itself in the catechism also, where what the teaching of the church says is that if there are bloodless means available to keep society secure, then um, we should not, you know, you should not re- resort to the death penalty. And the idea that you know, if if there are alternative ways to keep society secure without executing someone, we should resort to those first. I think has a lot of appeal to people, um, because you know it's it's quite a step to if you you know it's one thing to to kill someone in self defense, but once you've rendered them defenseless, um, you know, should we take that extra step? Of their, then executing them, and there, you know, there are a lot of issues that come with that. If if we want to have execution executions, then we have to train people to be executioners, and we found that you know that that also can be very difficult on folks who are charged to, to carry out executions, especially when things go awry. You uh, a little while back wrote an article for libertarianism.org focusing specifically on on libertarians and why they should not support the death penalty. And much of that article looked at an argument Murray Rothbard makes in his book, The Ethics of Liberty, which you called perhaps the classic libertarian defense of the death penalty. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about Rothbard's argument. Sure. He bases his defense on the death penalty on the principle of proportionality. So basically, um, if someone commits a crime, violates somebody else's rights, then their rights can be deprived to the, to the same extent. And going off that principle, Rothbard then says that 
you know, the only crime that could merit the death penalty is the crime of murder, because only if you've taken someone's life could you have your life taken from you. He... Now, one move he makes, which I think you know, a lot of people will be sympathetic to, is that when deciding whether or not someone receives the death penalty, uh, he, he leaves that decision in the hands of the victims. And that has intuitive appeal, because I think a lot of people are frustrated you know, in the current criminal justice system where, you know, sometimes victims are ignored and their, their needs aren't, aren't met or addressed. So he says it's up to, you know, it's up to the victims to decide whether or not to respond with an execution. And, you know, for the crime of murder, they could ask for less. They could ask for restitution. They could forgive the person, not ask for any punishment. Or they could ask for the death penalty. Um... Now, there's, there's one complication with the crime of murder because when there's a murder, the actual, the victim directly affected is dead and, you know, they're not able to, to respond. So the way that Rothbard addresses that is he says that people could put in their wills, they could designate someone in their family to make that decision for them, or they could put explicitly, you know, if I'm murdered, I would like the death penalty or I would not like the death penalty. There's also somewhat curious wrinkle in his argument too, uh, something that we really don't see today. Uh, he says that if, if there is a murder, um, the victims, like the victim's family, should have the right to enact ven justice or vengeance on their own, um, however you look at it. So if, you know, if someone in your family is murdered, the, the family members could, if they believe they know who committed the murder, they could actually go and have that person killed on their own. If they do that, um, they will, you know, they could, could have to come to court if the, if the other family argues that, in fact, they killed the wrong person. So there'll be an incentive not to do that, but he still wants to leave that option open to victims' families. Now, none of that seems to solve any problem about procedure or whether or not you can obtain these convictions uh, with a, enough confidence that you could actually kill someone if he's just purely arguing that it is possible that uh, some group of people can proportionally call for the death of someone who wronged them. But then figuring out who that person is through, through just processes seems to be not, not accounted in, that, in Rothbard's version of that. Yeah, that, that was one of my biggest, biggest concerns with his argument and – and I think especially in recent years, if we, as we have learned more about wrongful convictions and the many different things that can go wrong. Now, what is the, the number is now at about 140, isn't it? There have been, yeah, 143 individuals since 1973 in the U.S. have been sentenced to death and then new evidence came out that exonerated them. So, and there are other cases where executions have gone forward and there, there are doubts about whether or not the person was guilty. So there have been, and that those are just death row cases. There have been many more exonerations beyond just the folks that have been on death row. And presumably, there's a lot of people on death row who there no one's no one's going to look at the evidence. No one's trying. Yeah. No one's trying, um, but they're executed anyway. So that that wrongful death number is probably much much higher than 140. And that's. That's you know one of the problems in figuring out. Well, people often ask how many people have been wrongfully executed. Well, that, it's it's a diff difficult question to answer, and one of the main reasons why is that if an execution goes forward and there are concerns about whether the person was actually guilty, there's not much incentive for the state to actually investigate and figure out what what happened in that case. Uh, for instance, there is a crime. Uh, a murder in Texas, a uh, guy named Cameron Todd Willingham, and he was um, he was convicted of killing his three children in an alleged arson fire. It turns out, you know, our, since his original conviction, arson science has advanced dramatically, and basically the whole case against him fell apart. Um, there was a commission set up to to look into that case, but the state of Texas really put the brakes on that. And which, you know, isn't surprisingly, you know, state really doesn't want to admit when it's made such a, 
a mistake like that, if it does happen, it's usually decades mm-hmm. later rather than years later. Yeah, that seems to to bring in another interesting fact here. That you know, we talked about Rothbard's thing, which he doesn't really talk about the politics of it, just the feasibility of restitution system and allowing for for someone else's death. Uh, but if we bring in politics in the situation and talk about the politics of the death penalty and whether or not these state agents have have good enough incentives to rectify any mistakes to pursue innocence, and a lot of times it doesn't seem like they do. Yeah, and you know, I've I, I think when you look at these cases. You can easily sort of come to the conclusion, you know, all, you know, all these government actors are corrupt. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of them do their job well and should not be faulted, but it only takes a few bad apples and you can end up with a spectacular mistake. And one case I discuss in the article is the case of John Thompson. And you read through the details in that case and it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I actually did some work on that case, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. And like you read about, so basically what happened in this case, there was exculpatory evidence at trial, which the prosecutor suppressed, didn't allow to come out. And you know, some very key evidence like blood at the, at the crime scene that would have shown that he couldn't have been the perpetrator. But um, you read that one of the prosecutors in that case, he got diagnosed with a terminal illness. And he felt you know, really guilty about what he, de- what he did. He told one of the other prosecutors in the office that this evidence was suppressed. But that prosecutor you know, kept his mouth, you know, didn't, didn't spill the beans to anybody. And Thompson, meanwhile, is getting pretty close to his execution. He's you know, like a month away. Things are looking very bleak. They hire a private investigator who's finally able to... Um, dig out this evidence, but, you know, to have the knowledge that this person on death row is, is innocent, but not be willing to share that, uh, I mean, that just, it's shocking and, and very troubling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the uh, the issue in that case was whether or not uh, he had uh, the, the malfeasance, I mean, Thompson was eventually let off, but whether or not the, the practices of the the prosecuting attorneys were enough to be a policy or practice, not just a single iteration of a person doing something wrong, but whether if he was going to sue the state, it was a policy or practice of the entire department uh, that they constantly made these mistakes because that's the rule that they have for liability and the only way you can get recovery in that situation, which is part of the problem. If they don't have very high standards of liability, they not, may not try their hardest or do something like this. Exactly. And I, you know, I don't know where you, you come down on the case, but when you look at what was going on in the New Orleans DA's office... Uh, oh, it's unbelievable, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, repeated Brady violations. Um, that's, you know, withholding exculpatory, exculpatory evidence. Um, numer- numerous cases overturned. Um, and I, I think I think J- Thompson had a pretty good case that there was... There was you know, repeated abuses that merited um, compensation. But it also raised another interesting uh, fact about the level of damages because it seemed like one thing the Supreme Court was doing in that case was saying that he was awarded $14 million, which would have been nearly the entire budget of, of, this par- of this parish. And so they had these practical concerns about whether or not you could pay out the entire budget of a, of a local parish if you mis- misconvicted someone, which it seems to me that if you can't do that, then maybe that's a really good reason you shouldn't people on, put people on death row. If you, if, you can't, if you couldn't even make them whole if you messed up, right? Right. Um, how, how many people each year are executed in this country? Uh, recently, it's been in the low 40s. Um, it got up to uh, close to 100 in the late 90s, but it's been going down. Because well, I'm, I'm curious about the, the public reaction to these stories that we tell, like the um, 140 individuals who we know were, were innocent and put to death and the story of John Thompson. Like these are, these are really kind of terrifying stories. I mean these are stories of like you're an innocent person and your government, which is this enormously powerful thing, comes and – tells you you're guilty, locks you up and then – I mean if you're innocent, effectively murders you. Mm-hmm. Um, but we don't seem – there doesn't seem to be the sense of kind of widespread outrage at that sort of government action in the way that like when 
when you have the memo about the drones – you know, the, or Bridgegate, Chris right, like Christie, the, Bridgegate. The, the yeah. president's allowed to kind of <laughs> kill people without due process, or or even but the, the Edward in traffic going into New York City. Yeah, the Edward Snowden, um, you know, revelations of the the widespread spying. Like these are also really awful things the government's doing, but the government killing innocent Americans in fairly large numbers. Why why do you think we're just not? There doesn't seem to be the kind of ongoing widespread public outrage about that? Well, as I said earlier, I, I do believe that there is more concern about, about the process and I think that's good to see. You I mean you see mm-hmm. public support for the death penalty go down, executions go down, death sentences go down, more states get rid of it. So I think the trends are going in a positive direction and I think that has a lot to do with these cases of, of innocence coming to light. I think the reason that you you don't see the same level of engagement from the public as you might for NSA or even Bridgegate stuff is that this is it's this is an issue that it's it's hard for people to connect with sometimes because you know people that are sentenced to death row is a very small part of the population and a lot of times people feel that they can distance themselves that you know Oh, I would never, you know, I, I would never end up on death row. I couldn't be wrongfully convicted. And and you even hear, you hear people sometimes, well, if they weren't guilty of the murder, they must have been guilty of something. They, they deserve mm. to be there for something. <laughs> and I think that's why it's so important for people that have been wrongfully convicted to be sharing their stories because, you know, when they are able to engage the public and talk to them, you know, people are shocked and you see a lot of a lot of minds change because you have folks like Kirk Bloodsworth he was wrongfully sentenced to death in Maryland this guy was a former marine no criminal record at all um, yet you still had faulty eyewitness identification in this case that ended and he ended up on death row and you know at the time of the trial he was vilified in the media you know people, you know he was a killed a child they, they thought he was just an awful awful human being who needed to be executed right away fortunately he was able to get dna testing in his case and be fully exonerated and you know now is you know working across the country to try to try to end this system so are there widespread kind of disparities in who receives the death penalty like socioeconomically or Racial. racially yeah, there. I mean, throughout the death penalty's history, there have been disparities in how it's applied. Uh, 1972 is a key date. That's when the death penalty was struck down as unconstitutional in the Furman v. Georgia decision, um, and then it was brought back in 1976. Pre-1972, the disparities were very stark, um, and it's it's really hard to to deny that. So, for instance. Um, before um, before that decision, um, you could, in some places in the country, you could still be executed for the crime of rape. And you look at the period 1930 to 1967, 450 people were executed for the crime of rape. In 90% of those cases, it was a black individual convicted for raping a white woman. So basically, wow. this penalty was reserved for black individuals who were... You know, charged with raping white women. Um, you also find that you know in the South, in the hundred years after the Civil War, eighty percent of the individuals who were executed were black. The I mean, the disparities and the racism in the system is is very hard to deny. After nineteen seventy six, states tried to rewrite their death penalty laws to provide more guidance to juries to try to eliminate some of this bias, which riddled the system pre-1972. The problem is they they really didn't fix the system, and you, you see these disparities come up in, in other ways. So specifically what you find is that when the victim is white, prosecutors are more likely to seek the death penalty than when the victim is black or Latino. So you look at um, in the executions that have taken place since 1976, in 77 percent of those cases, the victim is is white. If you look at all the murders during that time period, the victim is white at a much lower rate, around fifty percent. 
And so, you know, this really raises concerns about the system where, you know, it seems that, you know, certain murders are treated different differently than other murders. Um, you also find, I mean, socioeconomic status does make a difference. If, if someone has high-powered attorneys, um, a lot of times prosecutors will just decide, you know, we're not even going to seek the death penalty. It's not even worth it. So uh, the, with the we've talked a lot about um, the problems inherent with with figuring this out, but but some listeners might be thinking, well, um, we even though there's some problems, you always can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. But there's a huge deterrence factor here, right? Uh, you, you know that something gets a death penalty. I know that if they made uh, jaywalking. Uh, Death penalty tomorrow. I would never jaywalk again. So, so isn't that isn't that something we'd be getting benefit out of? Maybe even at the expense of a few innocent lives. But we try our best and, and maybe don't do it right. But there are also innocents out there who whose crimes are not committed against them because people fear the death penalty. Well, for the jaywalking example, if you if you knew that you would get life in prison without parole for jaywalking, that probably would also be a pretty big incentive. Not to jaywalk. Yeah, well, it might be right on the edge there. No, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, now, I'm not advocating life in prison without parole for jaywalking by any means, but when answering that question, what we have to look at is not whether or not the death penalty is a deterrent. I mean, it, it is a punishment, and, you know, just by itself, yes, it, it can be a deterrent. The, the real question is, is it a deterrent over and above the alternative of life in prison without parole? Mm-hmm. And Good point. when you look at that, you know, there's there's really not much evidence out there that it is reducing murder rates, reducing crime. Um, you know, you can look broad statistics. You look at states with the death penalty, those that don't have it. States with the death penalty have higher murder rates on average than states that don't. Obviously, there are a lot of different factors that figure into crime rates, so that by itself isn't... Uh, by itself doesn't make the argument, but when you talk to you talk to criminologists, you talk to police chiefs, you also talk to the public at large. Time and time again, majorities of all those groups say, you know, the death penalty is not a deterrent over and above life in prison without parole. And if you know, if, if we are really concerned about preventing vi- violence, lowering crime, we have to ask ourselves. Is it worth spending all these millions of dollars on a death penalty that you know really has zero impact on murder rates, or should we use that money in other ways that you know have actually have some proven track record of being effective? Well, so, or someone might say that, well, you you we said that there's only been forty people killed, so you have a pretty pretty low probability of getting the death penalty. And even if you get it, people know that you'll spend 20 or 30 years on death row, which means that it's less deterrent because you might be 40 years old. So that might be about your expected lifespan anyway. So what if we just up the death penalty and lowered, you know, lowered the amount of appeals so we could just get you know, two years or just you know, kill you immediately? That seems like that would raise the amount of deterrence factor. There, there may be a point there. I mean if, if we – for every, you know, if we were executing lots and lots of people, it, it, there's a chance it could have a, a more deterrent effect. I don't know. You know, that's the only way you could do that is running an experiment, and that's a, it's going to be hard to get funding for that. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing that is pretty certain that if we started executing people at, at much higher rates, we'd be making a lot more mistakes. And when you, I mean, one thing about, Deterrence is that um, for for punishment to have any sort of deterrent value, um, you know, it has to be swift and also certain. And the death penalty is neither of those. The reason why is because we've had all these mistakes. The courts have said, you know, you have to go through you know, super due process in capital cases before you can carry out an execution. And what we find is that in states that do sentence more people to death, do carry out more executions. We find more mistakes in those cases. Uh, Florida is one example. Florida leads the nation in death row exonerations with 24 since 1973. Wow. What's shocking is that, you know, if you think, if you had that track record, the, you would think the response is, you know, whoa, we need to, you know, maybe we should get rid of this system or, you know, try to do more to keep 
uh, the wrong people from ending up on death row. Instead, they passed a bill last year to speed up the appeals process to try to execute people faster. And that, you know, given their track record, that's not going, you know, I'm, I'm very troubled to think what that what the results may be down the road. Mm. A lot of these stories are told of people being wrongfully convicted or the disparities between, say, the races in terms of who receives the death penalty seem to, to speak to a level of corruption going on. Like, you know, the the prosecutors intentionally withholding evidence or giving, you know, knowingly giving the death penalty to certain groups more than others. And I'm I'm wondering, is there does the death penalty in particular exacerbate that sort of corruption? Um, do we see, say, more of that sort of stuff if if prosecutors can get the death penalty than if they can only get life in prison? There are two Two factors to consider that you know may may lead to that result. Um, one is, you know, certain murder, you know, very high profile murder cases often present a lot of pressure to find somebody to to find who did it to be able to get a conviction. And if you know the if the community is demanding that there be some sort of response, sometimes you may find folks in law enforcement rush the process, narrow in on someone they think committed, you know, committed the crime and get tunnel vision. And so that, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind about capital cases because you you always hear the argument, well, we need the death penalty for the worst of the worst and the most heinous murders. I, I have a problem with that argument because tell any murder victim's family member that their lost wasn't the worst of the worst or the most heinous. That's I think it's very hard to say that to anybody, but if you if you keep the death you know if the death penalty is used in these very high profile crimes, that's oftentimes when there's the most pressure to to find somebody, and you can you know mistakes can result from that. Another thing to keep in mind is sometimes the death penalty is justified on the grounds that we need it to get plea deals. So. You know, prosecutors can threaten the death penalty to get somebody to, to plead to something less. And the problem with using the death penalty as a stick in plea negotiations is that you know sometimes people are scared and they'll confess to a crime they de- didn't even commit. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very important. You know, we've had cases like this. The, the Be- Beatrice Six in Nebraska, um, they were wrongfully committed, convicted of a murder that they didn't commit. Um, threatened with a death penalty, ended up confessing, and then years later finally shown innocent. So I think that's we need to be very careful about you know, using the death penalty in that manner. Yeah, a lot of people who who haven't read a lot of these cases and don't have a, a sort of lawyer's mindset on this would would be shocked how often that actually happens. But another one that I find surprising, which I'm sure you have uh, something to say, is is the level of eyewitness convictions. Uh, that lead to – that is usually a, a good enough evidence in many cases to lead to a death penalty conviction and, and eyewitness testimony is, is actually not that good, is it? Yeah, it's – we're learning more and more about the mistakes that can be made and oftentimes honest mistakes. I mean there's no – Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. No bad intentions there. It's just people identify the wrong person. Uh, one case that is particularly telling is the one of Jennifer Thompson Canino. And she was a, a college student in, I believe, is North Carolina, and she was raped. Um, and she was a straight A student, um, and she she made sure to study the face of the perpetrator um, because she wanted to send him away and make sure he never got it, never got out. He, she identified who she believed to be the be the killer um, was seen as the, the best possible witness you could have on the stand. We find out that years later, you know, there's DNA testing done and she had, you know, misidentified the, the actual perpetrator of the crime. Uh, it's actually an amazing story. They they reconciled and are now friends. But mm. that's I think that story really shows the mistakes that can be made with eyewitness testimony. 
You know, one of the more surprising things I thought in, in your article on libertarianism.org, which we'll link in the show notes, but uh, you, you talk about the costs too. I think a lot of people would say, well, this costs less than keeping them in prison for 40 years or 50 years and putting them up with cable TV and everything, but it doesn't seem to be accurate. The main reason for that is that lawyers are more expensive than prison guards. When prosecutors decide to seek the death penalty, they set in motion a legal process that's more drawn out. You're going to have uh, more attorneys, more investigators, more preparation before the trial even starts. And this is all because we've made mistakes in the past and the courts have said you need super due process in capital cases before you can execute someone. So just at the trial stage itself, and what's unique about capital cases is you have two separate phases. You have one phase to find out, is the person innocent or are they guilty? Then you have a whole separate phase where the jury is presented with mitigating and aggravating factors, and they have to decide whether or not to give the person the death penalty or life in prison without parole. So just at the trial stage itself, it often... A capital case often costs hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars more than a non-capital case. So you spend all that money up front, and that's really hard to make up, you know, regardless of how long the person ends up sitting in jail. But then, after the conviction, the person usually sits on death row for quite a long period of time, which is expensive because it's a higher security setting. Plus, you're going through the appeals in capital cases. Those cost more money. And you know, by the end of the process, it's millions of dollars more than if you just would have gone with life in prison without parole as, as the sentence. And you said also there are some municipalities who've been who've been had to raise taxes for that, which is which is it's a very big libertarian no no, right? Yeah, we I, I live I live in Kansas, and we had a hearing on a bill to repeal the death penalty a few weeks ago. And the chair of the Libertarian Party testified for the bill, and he's from Osage County here in Kansas. And they they had to do that. There was a capital case, and they had to raise taxes. And he was he was not very happy about that. I wanted to ask about American relation to the rest of the world on this issue, because one of the things that we we hear is we see these lists of you know <clears throat> that it's America, and then these other countries are the ones with the death penalty or. Um, and, and that America is one of the very few developed nations with the death penalty still. I'm just curious if you have any insights into why that is. Like what is it about America that makes us – even if even if the trend lines are, are drifting away from support for the death penalty, what makes us still support it much more than – Almost anyone else, yeah. yeah. Except for maybe North Korea and Cuba or other regimes like that. It's, it's hard to say and that this has been a subject of a lot of debate. When you look – when the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty in 1972, it looked like the U.S. was in line with a lot of the rest of the world because you had Britain, France, um, some other you – know, Canada, you know, all striking down the death penalty around the same time. You look back at the U.S.'s history, um, the first English – English-speaking territory to ever get rid of the death penalty was the state of Michigan. So there's actually you know, quite a, a long history in America of having some suspicion of the death penalty. But you know what happened after 1972 is that crime rates started to rise, and I don't think that had any connection with the death penalty, but some people went ahead and made that connection. And then it became every politician, regardless of which party you were in, felt the need to run on a pro-death penalty platform to show that you're tough on crime. And the public you know, responded to that, at least in you know, the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. You're not seeing that the same way today. Um, you're not mm -hmm. – it's just it's – most, it's, for most people, it's not their, their top priority issue. Um, and you're not, you know, you're not seeing it win elections like it did in the past. But you know, once that became ingrained in the political landscape here in the U.S., it became a very entrenched practice, which was very difficult to undo. That's why what's happened in the last six years with six states ending the death penalty is 
is historic and is such such a in, in sharp contrast to what happened in the preceding decades. And you also have sort of the the disturbing trend, which you see occasionally just with loudmouths, I guess, of of people uh, championing the death penalty and how we're not like the rest of the world, like we kill them quick down here in Texas type of stuff, which uh, doesn't seem to be uh, at least very heartening. Yeah, yeah, that's – and I've always had a, a real problem with using the death penalty as a, as a way to win political points and – because – Reducing crime is a very complicated issue, and there's mm-hmm. a lot of different factors that, that go into it. And politicians basically started, you know, I don't want to think about that problem. I'll just say I'm against the death penalty and get and try to get people to vote for me in that way. And you know, if we, if we want to be serious about reducing crime, then you know, there's a lot of different things to consider, and we shouldn't just take a shortcut by saying we're against the death penalty, which does very little to reduce crime. Or for death penalty. What what sort of things, just out of curiosity, should we consider if we're looking at reducing crime? That that is a a good question. One I don't have all the answers to, um, but I think you know it, it's interesting what the folks down at Right on Crime are doing. Um, they you know they they put out some interesting stuff, and you know, they got started in Texas. You had. You know this constant push to build more prisons in the state of Texas, and finally some people were like, "Hey, this is this is pretty costly, and this is you know quite a burden on taxpayers. Maybe we should look for a different you know different different way to respond." And you know, focusing more on you know especially for nonviolent offenders, having treatment programs instead of just you know, sticking them in jail, and you know, sometimes they come out worse than when they went in. Um, you know. Looking for ways, you know, realizing that most people that get in the criminal justice system and you know are in prison at some point they're going to be coming out, and be very aware of that fact. And you know, if they need treatment, getting folks that so that when they come out they don't reoffend. Yeah, and of course, uh, crime has been going down at a, a precipitous rate since the early '90s, really, and people are all scratching their heads about why. Um, and there's a lot of weird, interesting to 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 very far out there theories. There's a recent paper about maybe it's lead in the air. The amount of lead has reduced violent tendencies. But yeah, everyone's scratching their heads. The crime problem is very hard to figure out. Um, so we have to we'd have to ask you the the big question, the one I think everyone would be thinking about, uh, as all discussions eventually have to end up. What about Hitler? I mean, if we're going to oppose the death penalty. Um, would we still? Would, would you still oppose it for Hitler or some incredibly cruel person with everything on video and no one doubts that they did this? Is 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 that a concern you have or or something we should be addressing? I I mean, we're against the death penalty in all cases, and whether it's Hitler or um, a, you know, particular you know, a serial murder, you know, domestically, you know. People commit awful crimes, and that's unfortunately that's been the case throughout the history of humanity. Um, the, the problem is, is once you leave, you leave the door open for the death penalty. We're just going to have it for the worst of the worst. Um, you end up making mistakes, and innocent people get caught up in the process. I also think too. You, I mean, you often find this, especially at the state level. You have a particularly notorious uh, murderer, and they get sentenced to death. After they get sentenced to death, people, you know, news news stations are you know rushing to get get interviews with them. Every time there's appeal, they're back up, you know, back in the media. And I think you know a lot of times if we just you know life in prison without parole, lock them up, and Forget about them. That's it. Yeah, you, they're not going to get the same level of media attention that you often find in capital cases. We're, we're running out on we're running out of time, so I wanted to ask you just where do you see the debate right now, and where do you see things going? We're at a very interesting point in the country at the moment on this issue because you're seeing a number of states reject the death penalty, get rid of it, replace it with life in prison without parole more states considering going down that path. And then you're also seeing 
a, a smaller group of states really digging in their heels and trying to hang on to this practice as it becomes more and more difficult to carry out. Um, there have been a number of problems recently with um, corrections departments having problems getting the drugs necessary for executions. So you've seen some somewhat strange bills. In, in Virginia, there's a proposal to bring back the electric chair. In Missouri, there's been a proposal to bring back the firing squad. Some states are really trying to speed up the appeals process despite having a, a very long history of, of making mistakes in capital cases. Disturbing. Yeah, and so uh, it will be very interesting to see what happens in those states. Um, I'm very I'm concerned that, you know, as they really dig in their heels, you may see some more spectac- spectacular mistakes going forward. I, I hope it doesn't happen, and I hope we're actually able to, to stop it everywhere. But that's that's a real concern, and I think, you know, as as that happens more and more, you know, people are going to keep turning away from the death penalty and eventually it go away entirely. But that is one worry is, you know, these states that are really digging in their heels, what could potentially result from the policies that they're pushing? And your organization is uh, working, working hard on this issue, correct? Yeah. So I, we work. Uh, it's conservatives concerned about the death penalty, and online that's conservativesconcerned.org. We're on Facebook and Twitter. Um, definitely keep folks up to date on updates on what's going on, ways you can get involved in your own state in, on this issue. If you have any questions or comments about today's episode, you can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And you can find me on Twitter at T C Burris, T C B U R R U S. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.